my uh, when I did my PhD at, at York, uh, my plan was to be an economist. I thought at some point, no, I mean this is this is just the wrong audience, it's the wrong match. So I have to move to law school, and that was a big challenge because in Europe you can't just move across departments um, right. without having the proper degrees. You have to accept things as they are, and and try to move ahead. Just don't get upset, depressed, frustrated. Move ahead, accept as they are, be competitive. Uh, and be professional. I think that's very important, be professional. Welcome to a new episode of 10 plus 1 Questions, Real Life in Academia. A talk show in which we ask established scholars about their careers, the best pieces of advice they have received, and tips and tricks to better navigate the academic world. Our guest today is Nuno Garupa. Nuno is a professor of law, associate dean for research and faculty development and faculty director of graduate studies at the Anton and Scalia Law School at George Mason University in Arlington, Virginia. Previously, he held academic positions at different universities in the US as well as in Spain, Portugal and the UK. Nuno holds a PhD in economics from the University of York and an LLM degree from the University of London. In his research, he focuses on the economics of law and legal institutions, empirical legal studies, and comparative judicial politics. Among other things, Nuno has served as Vice President of the European Association of Law and Economics and as co-editor of the Review of Law and Economics. In 2010, he was awarded the Spanish Julian Marias Research Prize. Now, What might be lesser known about Nuno is that, even though he is Portuguese, he's not really a big fan of soccer or of Cristiano Ronaldo. And if he is offered port wine with lemon juice, he would probably turn it down. Welcome Nuno. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It is a great honor and pleasure to have you on our show. As the show is called 10 plus 1 questions, real life in academia, I would like to start right away with our first question. No, no. Given the choice of anyone in the world, whom would you want to have as a dinner guest? Well, I'm, I'm going to assume it has to be someone alive. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, death, the dinner guests are always sort of complicated. And uh, I'm not a big expert on the afterlife. So assuming you mean someone alive, I'm going to say Judge Posner, because Judge Posner is the founding father of Lonic economics without being without being unfair to you know Ronald Coase or Guido Calabresi and others that of course were also big big solid names uh, but just Posner is definitely I think the person that um, uh, sort of infused the field and I, I, I started law and economics after reading his, his, his uh, book so I, I would definitely have to be a judge Posner. I think that's an excellent excellent uh, choice Now, when we, when we shift the focus a bit and like look into more, you know, into the working life of yours, um, you're very prolific. You have, you know, served as editor and been in several committees. How does a typical working day look like for you? I mean, it does, it does vary. I mean, it, 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 is, it is a tricky question given, given COVID, right? Because a typical day right. under a COVID regime is not the same as a typical day uh, outside of COVID regime. I mean, right now, a typical day is fundamentally um, between teaching and research and most of the time at home, obviously, because, because although technically our university is open, people are not um, advised to go there. But before COVID, I think I, I, I combine a lot of my teaching duties at the university mm -hmm. with a lot of traveling. I did a lot of conferences. I, I personally like to travel, so I went to many, many places. And for many, many years, I frequently commuted between the United States and Europe. I had connections in many European universities, um, in Portugal and Spain, obviously, but also the Netherlands, in Germany, in Italy, in France, and of course, my, my duties here. So I made an effort for a while to concentrate my teaching in one semester, so to have the other semester to travel around. And that, that worked well for a while, but then I guess you just get older and lazier and airports starting to be a bit, you know, um, fed up. And so you, you sort of travel a lot. And then COVID 
happen. So we will see how it happens after COVID. When we, we um, look at these challenges, or we discuss the COVID um, situation, and this is, of course, a huge challenge um, worldwide in many respects. Um, when we look uh, at your career, um, what was the greatest challenge you had to overcome in your career? So, so my career, I mean, there are different stages in my career, and I don't think, I mean, I don't think when I, I took my, uh, when I did my PhD at, at York, uh, my plan was to be an economist. I mean, I, it was not in my plan to go to a law school, and that's why I didn't do uh, what I would advise someone who wants to do that to do, which is first take your law degree, and then take your economics degree rather than just a straight economics degree with no law. So that was not my plan, but at some point I, I sort of concluded that the things I do are more relevant for a law school audience mm. than for, for economists. And, and I taught for a few years in Pompeo Fabro, which is a great, uh, great econ department, top in Europe. But my conclusion was always that the seminars were never on things I wanted, uh, every time I presented a paper, I, I got only the graduate students because they were forced to be there. Okay. Uh, because basically the faculty had no interest on what I was doing, except to ask me if the refinement of the national equilibria was particularly relevant for the, the <laughs> for contracts or for litigation. So I thought at some point, no, I mean, this is, this is just the wrong audience. It's the wrong match. I have to move to the law school. And that was a big challenge because in Europe, you can't just move across departments. Um, right without having the proper degrees. We are still in Europe, very much of a 19th century culture of, you have a degree in this area, you have to stay in this area, you're not supposed to be out of this area. Uh, and in the US, because of the structure, I don't think it's by design in any way, mm. it's simply because of, of, the, of the way law schools were created as professional schools rather than as uh, degree schools. I think, I think that, that, that helped the American system and facilitated for me to do this transition in the US rather than, um, rather than in Europe. I'm not saying it's easy, in no way. Uh, there's a big debate in the US also about this, but marginally, it's slightly easier here than, than in Europe. When we talk about career paths and um, how we progress through you know, all the challenges, how we master them and uh, try to find our way, um, what is the best piece of advice someone has given to you? Well, my, piece, my, my, my best piece of advice, um, um, most of the advice I got as, in Portugal when I was planning my career was don't do it. So that was not the best piece of advice I got <laughs> there. Um, but my, my best piece of advice I actually got from my, um, my PhD advisor uh, was then a, a professor at uh, York. He's now a professor in economics in Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he was sort of, you shouldn't plan too much ahead. You have to be able to adjust and accept how it goes. And I think that's right, because mm -hmm. if you try to plan too far ahead, um, there's very likely that you won't be able to uh, do as you plan. You might even do better. I'm not saying you do worse. You might actually sure. do better than plan. Yeah. But you have to be able to accept how it goes. Otherwise, um, and, I, and we all know some colleagues like that, you go from frustration into frustration into frustration uh, because things do not succeed. For example, a very quick example. When I got to Pompo Fabra, um, there was a big discussion back in 97, 98, where to send your papers. Mm -hmm. And I was very humble. I said, I'm going to send my papers to C journals and the ones I better, I'm trying B journals and let's see if I succeed for a while and then I'll try higher. And I had colleagues who were coming from Harvard and Stanford and New Chicago say, no, no, I only try A journals. Anything less than A journals, it's uh, worthless. What happens after five years when we went for tenure, up for tenure, I had publications. These people had no publications whatsoever. Right. They were doing what they had been told to plan ahead. But the problem is, well, you have to accept this is a very competitive market. Um, the one thing academics all know, when you become an academic in general, you are someone who has been succeeding academically since kindergarten. And so you are used to be one of the best and the brightest in the room since you were a child. And by the time you become a professor, you have to realize, hang on, there are brighter people than me. Because at this point, you have a self-selected group of people. So you have to live with that. Your ego, when you get your first rejection letter, 
you have to live with someone telling to you your work sucks and it's and it's and it's life i mean and and, and next time you're going to write a letter like that about somebody else but that's how <laughs> the world works yeah. and i think that's that's the advice i give people and that's advice i got you have to accept things as they are and and try to move ahead just don't get upset depressed frustrated move ahead accept as they are be competitive uh and be professional i think that's very important be professional so thank you for sharing this knowledge and insights, really. And I think this brings me to my next question, and which is related in a sense. So do you have academic role models or do you have somebody in academia who has inspired you and keeps inspiring you? So I, 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 I had, I had, I mean, I have, I have, uh, depending, depending on my, on what, what I'm doing. I mean, I, some people, and I'm, I'm going to refer to, uh, Tom Ulan, because someone I worked very closely in Illinois, and I think he was the best colleague I had in my life, because he's a very tolerant, uh, friendly way of saying things, and that that was for me a lesson. Um, but just to make the opposite point, I also had I oh, at the same time I had Tom there it was Larry Epstein, who was the toughest um, and the most demanding colleague I ever had. Unfortunately, already passed away, and I also learned a lot from Larry. Uh, and, and in fact, um, because Larry was the kind of person that would come to your office and tell you, your paper sucks. And, and, and you might not like to hear that the first time, but then you understand yes. he's actually helping you because, because, because the referees are not going to be so nice. Um, <laughs> uh, and they will be anonymous <laughs> and they will be anonymous. So they will tell you worse things because yeah. they're anonymous. Yeah. And the fact that you have someone who can actually tell you, look, everyone is clapping you and saying how wonderful you, your paper is. Now, let me tell you, it's all wrong. Um, so that, that, that's part of, of the culture we need to have. I, I, I think, I think um, this varies a lot, I know. Um, and my background, as you said, I'm Portuguese. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our culture in the south of Europe, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, is sort of a culture where we're supposed to tell the person how great the person is, and we're not supposed to tell the person uh, it sucks, right? We, we should say in the back, Right when the person is out of the room, that's when we say it sucks. But in front of the person, we say it's wonderful, it's marvelous, uh, and that's and that's not the way to progress because you need to face critique and criticism. Uh, of course, it's hard. I mean, I like. I mean, I don't like. I mean, you know, I'm sort of almost senior, not yet that senior, but almost senior. And yeah. still, when I get a rejection letter, it must be my rejection letter number five hundred thirty-three. <laughs> I still don't like, of course, because nobody likes a rejection. I mean, of if course. I submit it to a journal, it's because I wanted yeah. to publish there. Now, I don't like to have a rejection letter, but yeah. at some point you understand. I mean, this is, this is things you have to work with and you learn. You learn, for example, doing things like, oh, maybe the referee has a point. Okay, maybe the referee is not just a jerk who does not understand my work. Maybe the referee has a point there and I should have known this, and I should yeah. have written this in a different... Oh, oh, if the referee didn't read correctly my paper, it's my fault, because I should have written in a way that the referee understands. And so I think there's a lot of learning here, and I learned from both extremes. Let's put it this way. Tom being the very gentle, nice person, yeah. and Larry being the tough person that tells you, no, you're not going with this paper, you know, garbage, you should just rubbish, you know, it's, it's a bad paper. And I think both are... are were very important people in my, in my learning in academia. I, I guess we could call you an, an empirical legal scholar uh, besides being an economist. And when you actually um, you know, give mentorship to, um, to, you know, to younger scholars, what would you say are the three most important qualities that an empirical legal scholar should have? So I think the first thing is um, you should know about what you're talking about. And I think this is definitely very important in empirical legal studies because the field, it, it's now in a, a different stage of evolution, obviously. But in the beginning, a lot of people in law that were trying to do empirical legal studies had a very weak background in the kind of matrix. And that is sort of a problem. Now, I don't, I don't think people need to go and get a PhD in the kind of matrix, but you need to invest some time. I mean, you need to even if you're not writing the, the regressions and you have a co-author helping you with the regressions, you need to have a sense when you look at the table, what the table means, what you're talking about, what are the standard problems. So the first advice is learning. You need to learn about what you're talking about. Uh, you can't just go through 
a seminar saying, oh, that's Michael Water. Oh, that's Michael Water. Oh, that's Michael Water. So I think that's the first thing you need to learn. Now, fortunately, and this relates to the point we were making earlier, with COVID, there are so many of these seminars online now that you can take for free, five seminars on econometrics, four seminars on whatever. You just have to find them and do it. The second, in my view, advice is always um, start with a problem. A lot of people, I think, made the mistake of starting with the data. Oh, I got data from whatever. Uh, can I ask a question to the data? I think that's the wrong approach. Um, you should start with a general problem, whatever you're doing, contracts, torts, property, whatever you are doing, and what is the question? What kind of the data do I need to answer that, um, that question? Sometimes the data is not going to be good enough, so you may end up with a project that's more qualitative than quantitative. But I don't think, I mean, in, in law rather than economics, that's still acceptable. There are many journals that still, high-ranked journals that still value quantitative uh, rather than, um, I mean, qualitative rather than quantitative um, uh, projects. And the last, and the, the, the third thing is, I think you need to find um, an environment where this kind of work is valued. Uh, and it's not valued everywhere. And I think the most frustrating thing for a scholar is to be in a department of law uh, where people don't think highly of this kind of work. Because it might be fun in the beginning, but at some point it's frustrating because you don't feel the support of other people. And, and this support might just be intellectual interest. I mean, many of my colleagues, I've been in different law schools in the US, know nothing of empirical legal studies. And in fact, some of them I suspect hate empirical legal studies. But in fact, they still are supportive in the sense they have an intellectual interest. Like, like is this, I mean, can you tell me something about this? Is this something people have talked about? And I think this, are, this is important. I, I don't think, I don't believe in a model of you being a missionary or even a Christ in the cross for a particular cause. That's not what you're supposed to do. So I think that some, to some extent, that's important when you're looking for a job. You should try to be in places that are value your work and are valuable for your work. Right. And actually, this um, this is um, these three qualities are in, very important. I mean, I think the the first point, uh, know what you're talking about. I think it applies to every single like area of scholarship, but definitely for yeah. empirical legal studies. And starting with the problem, I think it's you know it's so relevant. I, I remember once we had dinner in the Hague, and and you told me that you are mainly interested in why something is the way it is and not how and all those kind of explanations that we lawyers are so fond of. But I not really like, I really remember that very, you know, very fondly because I thought it's really important to actually focus on the problem that is underlies, um, you know, like, um, underlies a paper because that's basically the, you know, the motivation as well. So I thought it was very, very inspiring. And talking, I'd like to grab to, to um, actually take it from your last, the last point you made, uh, the support of the departments. So you are an economist, as you have already told us, and you um, you moved to a law school. And um, one thing that I um, that we have perhaps touched upon, but we still I'd like to, to ask you about is like what like when you look at your career path, what was the the, the you know like besides the the fact that people might not have you know appreciated your your work as much uh, at a at department of economics, what was the, the key um, a, a aspect that made you actually switch to law to a law school? I, I think it's, I, I, I don't think you can say there's one day where you wake up in the morning and you decide I want to go to a law school. So I think there's a building process of decisions moving in that direction. I visited Harvard and Stanford law schools in, 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 the, in the early 2000s. And then I went back to Illinois in 2004. I was here at actually George Mason for a semester in 2004, then Illinois in 2006. So there's, there's, there's a growing process by you sort of being exposed and concluding that, okay, this is the sort of environment where I want to work, and I can't find this sort of environment in, uh, in, in, um, in Europe. Although, for example, when I was at Pompeo Fabra, I had excellent cooperation and collaboration with the law school at Pompeo Fabra. But again, the law school at Pompeo Fabra, which I think is one of the top law schools in law and economics in Europe, but again, we're talking about, you know, what, five people out of 100 professors, so it's not really a huge, I mean, it's huge for Europe, but it's not like saying it's a huge group of people in, in, a, in a school. What would, what would you say are the, you know, like the plus and minuses of, of having such an international career? 
Well, I, I think at the minus is at some point you don't have um, the um, sort of attachment to mm. a particular institution or country that, that you might think of. I mean, I, I don't think of myself as Portuguese anymore. Of course, I'm Portuguese. It's my native language. And at the end of the day, I want to retire and go back to Portugal by the time I'm 75 or whatever. But it's not, it's not, it's not, it's still a long time to go. Huh? There's a sense of loss that, that you, don't, you don't belong to any particular specific culture. You end up being foreigner everywhere at some point, in the, fact, in the sense that you don't really belong 100% to that culture because, because either you are an immigrant or, or an immigrant, right, with E or I. I mean, it's, you, you know, it's, it's always sort of the problem. Um, however, I think, I think there's a big advantage in terms of, of the learning you have from all these experiences. And, um, and they're all different. I mean, I've, I've taught in very different countries, Spain, Portugal, UK, uh, US, and, and then, you know, short courses in different countries. And, and I think it gives you a very, very wide view. Um, I think it also makes you a very tolerant person. And I think that's mm. to be appreciated again within the Portuguese culture, because we are a very homogeneous culture. And our culture is not, although, although it's a self-proclaimed tolerant culture, in fact, it's not very tolerant. Because it's tolerant because we're all the same. So, of course, we're very tolerant. We're all the same. Exactly. Uh, and so you learn that basically people are actually different. And so that actually makes you more tolerant to all yeah. these differences that at least I hadn't been exposed when I was growing up in my own native country. Uh, when you look back at your career, um, do you feel you have any academic regrets, like a book you didn't publish, an article that you didn't revise and resubmit, something that you wish you, you would have done differently? Yes, there are a few articles I, did, I, didn't, uh, I got rejected, I didn't resubmit. I blame my co-authors for that, but, and that's the way to live with that. It blames somebody <laughs> else. But, but yes, definitely there are a few articles that, that, that for different reasons never got out of, of, the, of working papers. And that's sort of, sort of a, um, a regret. Um, I also regret that I didn't do um, things I should have done. For example, I, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I was actually accepted at the master program in, in government and political science at LSE. And I was persuaded by some friends that I shouldn't do it because that would delay my PhD. Now, that when you're 23, 23, 24, might look like a year is a huge thing. Now, when I'm 50, it's like, no, I should have done that. I should have done that. I should have wasted that year. Wasted was, is a way of saying, and, and, and delay my PhD a year. But that's things that once you're older, you start thinking, why did I speed up there when I could have you know, done it slower? But that's yeah. fine. You, you live with it. <laughs> Um, I can imagine. I think like looking back, everything is like, looks a little bit more, um, you know, it looks a little bit smaller and it's, it's easier to make it more relative, I guess. Um, so we are approaching the last question from our side. Um, so what is like, of course, you can, you can read all kinds of things on your CV, on, on the websites of the place you have worked at. But what is the one thing that most viewers would not know about you and that you would like to share with them? Most viewers would not know about about me. Looking from the looking from the CV, oh, there's so many things. First, that my uh, free time I spent reading books in history. I actually like medieval history. I was using the mm. example of medieval <laughs> history as the guy who has yeah, no yeah, yeah. Title opportunity. But that's because I'm a frustrated medieval historian. I should have oh, been yeah. a medieval historian. Um, <laughs> then, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I mean, they will not know that I end up doing economics by pure mistake. This was not, I did not want to be an economist. Um, and I, I should have been an historian and that's what I would have liked to be. But unfortunately the life went, it went to, 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 uh, economics. So that's one thing. It's not on my, um, on my CV. The other thing I hide on my CV is everything I write about Portuguese politics, because I like to be a provocateur and Ooh. therefore that's part of I my role <laughs> outside of, yes, outside of <laughs> academia. Um, my role is to, you know, sort of generate discussion, not to provide the answers to the discussion. So that's something I also don't, don't, don't have it there. Um, I have published a few bu uh, books on, on, on my own books on, on Portuguese politics, but I, as you know, I don't include them on the CV because I don't think they're academic work. So no, no, now we go. So we, we have had our 10 questions and I'm very grateful um, for your, all your frank uh, and direct answers. 
they were very non-Portuguese, I must say, and I love it. Um, but now we have, we have asked you to prepare a plus one question that you have always wanted to ask someone or be asked. So what is your plus one question? So my plus question is what would you or me have done if not to be an academic, right? That's, 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 that's a sort of a question that I, I would like to uh, raise. And then um, let, let's start with that one. Thank you very much. Thank you yeah, so thank you. much.